Good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, this training is by the Ohio Chapter American Academy of Pediatrics, the Parenting and Meal Time and Playtime Program. Um, today we will be talking about playing at home inside during COVID-19 and colder weather. And um, we want to thank ODH for their support with the Parenting and Meal Time and Playtime Project and these trainings. Um, we have done quite a few trainings so far, and we're excited to present this one. Um, throughout the training, if you have any questions, please feel free to put those into the chat box, and um, our speaker will get to them um, when she can. Um, just a few reminders. We have upcoming trainings. Our next one is February 24th at 10 a.m. on leadership, culture, and communication in the era of COVID. We have had, we have four live webinars on the office supporting well child visits and four on best management of practice management. Um, we also have a toolkit, a parenting email time and playtime toolkit that we have launched and you can register there. And then we also have a parenting email time and playtime journal club that you can receive 20 MOC part two and 20 CME credits for participating. So if you're interested in either of those, please sign up there and you can also register for our remaining trainings using the link on the flyer. And I also just wanted to share a little bit more about our PMP toolkit. Um, each Tool, each module is split up into different sections. So we have an overview of PMP, the importance of PMP, how to implement it into your practice or your organization, um, the different PMP resources that we have available, age specific handouts, the mobile app, and then topics specific handouts. We go into detail about social media um, and how to engage families, motivational interviewing, EMR tools that you can copy and paste for your dot phrases, troubleshooting tips, some more detailed information about well care, immunizations, and mental health, um, some evaluation resources, and then additional trainings that we have for CME credit. So um, all the parenting at meal time and playtime trainings that are have CME credit available are linked there and you can watch them on demand and earn a certificate of participation or CME and MOC part two credit. And um, you can register for the toolkit via the link there and we hope that you do. Just a little bit more about the resources that we have. Um, our mobile application you can download on Google Play or the App Store and it has uh, age specific handouts, topic specific handouts, as well as videos and a ton of information on there um, that you can access. You can also access it on our Ohio AAP website. Just a few Zoom tips before we get started. Please make sure that all your lines are on mute. You can ask questions and comments in the chat box. Please do not share your video. And if you have trouble hearing or seeing the presentation, please let us know in the chat box and we will get that fixed. Our speaker today is Dr. Michelle Levitt. Um, I will let her introduce herself and then we will get started. Again, thank you everyone for joining today. Please ask any questions, comments in the chat box. Thank you again to ODH for the support with these trainings and we are excited to share this information with you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you everyone for joining. Okay, so first of all, I have no disclosures. And just a little bit about me. I work for Akron Children's Hospital. I've been there practicing childhood obesity and weight management for eight years. Before that, I did primary care for about 15 or 20 years. So I've been in pediatrics for 25 plus years. When I'm not working for the hospital, I'm working out with kids. I'm a personal trainer. I'm a youth fitness specialist. Um, I do recess and results classes. And in our community, I run the program called Strong Kids, which is a physical literacy program for kids in our local community. So love it. So our objectives today, number one, to review how the COVID pandemic has affected families getting active. Number two, explain the benefits of physical activity and powerful play. Know the physical activity recommendations and the importance of supporting physical literacy. Describe the role of the pediatrician in promoting active play and physical literacy how to write a fitness prescription, know the resources available on physical activity assessment and counseling, and then list at least five ways families can get active playing inside during cold weather. 
So for review, um, Alex mentioned that we have already had some training series and Dr. Bowling just did one recently on wellness during COVID. So, and that kind of complements the AAP statements that have been coming out recently about the pandemic and obesity being on the rise and that we all need to be doing a little bit more to be more aggressive and assertive with managing these kids. So Dr. Bowling did a great training on that and it's a nice compliment to this training. So if you can catch that one, um, that would be great. And then two of the primary articles that are referenced throughout this um, training are I think really important for you to read. They have really valuable information. They'll give you a great handle on physical activity and the power of play and the role of the pediatrician. So these are both in the Journal of Pediatrics. You can see the reference there. One is on the power of play and the other one is physical activity assessment and counseling in pediatric clinical settings. So really practical, a great, those are great resources. And then back in May, Dr. Murray did a training on powerful play. So those are great resources to review and actually complement what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so just review. I think we're all pretty well aware of what's happening during COVID. Um, it's creating the perfect storm for obesity and inactivity. So just running through quickly, you know, the social isolation, more confinement, the quarantines, kids aren't getting fresh air, they're not getting sunshine, the school's closing, reopening, closing, reopening, um, the, the kids aren't having access to their mental health resources, their nutritional support, and then things like gym class and recess, um, youth sports and activities being canceled, fitness centers closing. Um, it also depends on your region. Some things are more closed than others. Lot, complete loss of structure and routines, irregular sleep. Uh, these all contribute to the kids getting more and more and more inactive. Um, economic loss is a big one. Insecurity in general, food insecurity, um, increased fast food consumption, increase in sitting, sedentary behavior, consuming social media and being on the screens even more. It was already bad before COVID. It's getting worse. Um, and then of course, the health inequities, which um, Dr. Bowling really talked about a lot in his training. So we won't go there, but um, being stuck inside in the winter, even outside of COVID, it's already makes kids, people more inactive, families more inactive. There's no motivation to get moving. So winter time in general is a problem, but when you put COVID plus winter, it's the perfect storm for inactivity. <laughs> so let's first talk about the benefits of physical activity and play. So we talk a lot about physical activity, exercise, but we really need to emphasize play more and the value of play. But I think, I think everyone's really well aware of the benefits of physical activity, but I think it's really important to be even more familiar with them. So they kind of rattle off your tongue and you can connect them to things you're talking about in your well child and sick care visits. So if you can connect a benefit to something that's happening with the child right then, it's gonna resonate more with the family than just telling them you should exercise and here's why. So if we can connect it to something that's happening in their world, it's gonna be uh, more beneficial, more impactful. So it's just running through them so you get a little more familiar and take some time to really get versed in those. Improves cardiorespiratory fitness, makes our heart stronger, makes our lungs stronger, builds strong bones, strong muscles. Of course, development of fine motor skills, large motor skills, um, gross motor skills, helps control weight, helps control blood sugar, helps reduce stress and symptoms of anxiety and depression mood, improves sleep, helps reduce the risk for chronic health conditions, which we're trying to prevent overall with kids, obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure, prediabetes, diabetes, cancer, osteoporosis, Etc. Improves balance, coordination, and flexibility. Boosts self confidence. This is a super important one. And then if we all know that it's linked to improved academic and performance, um, which just kind of breaks my heart while well, these kids don't have gym and recess in school. But and then um, there's been a lot of articles out recently with COVID about how physical activity dire directly is directly related to strengthening strengthening the immune system. So that's really important. One you can kind of mention a lot because COVID, we're talking about immunity and we can link physical activity to the importance of that strengthening our immune system. So let's talk about, so that's benefits of physical activity overall. Let's talk about the power of play. So play is a really important thing to understand and promote because play is fun, right? It doesn't seem like work. When we say physical activity, it automatically just seems heavy, right? So, so let's really engage the power of play in our practices. Um, so play provides a unique opportunity to not only promote the physical benefits like we just discussed, but also socio-emotional, cognitive language, self-regulation skills, everything needed to develop the brain and for executive functioning skills. 
So it's also really important. It's a, it's a really great way for parents to be fully engaged and present with their kids. Because when we're playing, we forget about everything else, right? So we're engaged and present, we're playing, our kids feel secure, they feel loved. And um, again, that, that links to supporting that formation of the safe, stable, nurturing environment with their parent or their caregiver, and kids need that to thrive. Play is really important in the, in the presence of childhood adversity. So if kids are experiencing childhood adversity, play is a, is a direct way to counter that. Super important, as we talked about earlier, play enhances brain structure and function directly. So that's why it's super important to start promoting play even in infancy. So let's talk more about play. Play will help develop learning skills. It helps develop social skills. A big one here during COVID is it modulates or buffers adversity and down regulates the body stress response. So that's a really important one right now because we're all experiencing a lot of adversity with COVID and play directly modulates that and down regulates the stress response, response. super important. Um, of course, it helps with social, emotional and executive functioning skills. That's really important. It's not getting developed in schools. Kids as, as young as preschool are already doing like desk work instead of active play. Um, play promotes leadership skills, teamwork skills. Again, we talked about confidence, independent thinking. Um, it helps kids develop things like curiosity, imagination, because they're just playing, they're using the innate things that they were born with, but they've been suppressed by our society and our culture and our social media and the screens. Um, it helps foster other character traits like joy, empathy, resilience, persistence. And we know that play is directly linked to language and literacy. And then of course, play just boosts your mood. As soon as, as soon as you start playing, you just get in a good mood. You're happy, you're smiling. It gives you a better outlook on life. Who doesn't want that, right? And we want that for our kids, right? We want that for our kids. So let's go into a couple bit, a couple stats just to kind of just hammer in like why this is so important. So 26% of teens, only 26% are meeting the actual recommended guidelines for physical activity, only 26%. And only a fourth of the kids overall are meeting the guidelines. Preschoolers spend more than six hours in sedentary activity. More than 40% of children watch three or more hours of TV per day on school days. So you can imagine what it is on the weekends, right? Uh, the average eight to 18 year old spends more than seven hours in front of a screen. Okay, and then this is really important to kind of pay attention to in your practice. The lowest rate of physical activity occur in adolescent girls, youth with special needs and uh, minority youth. So we kind of want to really hone in and, and pay attention to those populations because they're more at risk because they have the lowest rates. Um, as cited in this journal of pediatric article, only 23% of family practice, family practitioners and 33% of pediatricians were able to correctly identify the current physical activity guidelines. I thought that was kind of low myself, but it's just a little bit of a wake up call for us. So let's review the physical activity guidelines. These are the current recommendations. And there's a nice table on this in that journal of pediatrics article. Um, and it's in two different forms, one like a table form and one listed. So you can kind of reference that. If that's easier to have one place to reference all these things. But infants should be active play several times a day. They need at least 30 minutes throughout the day of physical activity. And we'll talk about what that looks like later. Um, one to three year olds, three hours, three hours. So any intensity, one to three year olds should be active, playful, moving for three hours a day. Three to five year olds, also three hours. So about every 15 minutes that they're awake, they should be moving. Um, and the 60 minutes of those three hours should be moderate to vigorous. And we'll talk about that, what that means in the next slide. Um, then six to 17 year olds, the recommendation is 60 minutes daily, at least, of course, we always want more, but 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous. So it's not 60 minutes of just every kind of exercise. It's 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous. And then of course, any other exercise we get is just added benefit, right? So it's really important to note that this can be cumulative in 10 to 15 minute increments. So it's not like you have to carve out 60 minutes or you tell the families. It's really important to tell this to the families because when you say, oh, you need 60 minutes of activity a day or one hour a day, that just seems really overwhelming to families. So you really need to empower families with saying, you know what, in 10 to 15 minute bursts, they add up quick, let's get to an hour. And that's more doable for a family. So when you say you should get 60 minutes a day, you should be getting an hour a day, you should be getting three and three hours a day for your preschooler. They should know because I think three hours is probably the one that most people didn't know. Um, they should know it's three hours so they can be like, whoa, my kid is not getting three hours. And how can I, how can I do that? How can I schedule that in? 
Um, so it can be a cumulative that's super important to empower families with. And then um, six to 17 year olds should also have three days a week that have muscle and bone strengthening exercises. And, and uh, if they're not meeting their guidelines yet, you wanna start slow and gradually increase them. Cause like I said, if you're going from zero to 60, you're like, whoa, I, that's not happening. And then you just don't do anything. So we wanna start slow and gradually increase them and get them enjoying activity and loving it and then building on that. So let's talk about the types. Um, because we talk, we talk about moderate to vigorous all the time. So what does that mean? So light is, it's just easy. Like you're just walking, going for an easy walk, shopping around the mall, playing catch, um, doing your chores. So you're, you're, you're easily able to have a conversation, a full conversation without like stopping and breathing. You're not sweating. You're not short of breath. And so that's just like kind of everyday um, activities. I call that NEAT, which is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And that is where you're just like you park farther away. You take the stairs instead of the elevator. You're just getting more what's called NEAT, which is not actual formal exercise, but you're getting more active. So moderate is you're starting to feel a little bit warm. You're maybe sweating a little bit, shorter breath a little bit, and you can talk, but it's getting a little bit more difficult. And then vigorous is like hardcore. Your heart is beating fast, you're sweating, your face is red, you're short of breath, and you can't talk. And so, of course, you're not going to maintain a vigorous for 60 minutes. So there's where those 10 to 15 minute little bursts come into play. Um, and a lot of like a lot of sports activities, it's like a burst of vigorous activity. And then there's like light to moderate in between, for example, like soccer or something or basketball. So um, so moderate to vigorous is the goal. And again, remember the uh, preschoolers, three hours a day, 60 should be moderate to vigorous. And then your six to 17 year olds and adults should be, all should be moderate to vigorous. Um, and then bone strengthening or muscle strengthening is when you're just lifting, okay? You're pushing, you're pulling, you're lifting either your body weight or an object. And then bone strengthening is weight bearing exercises. So that would be like running, jumping rope, tumbling versus something like swimming, which is not weight bearing, okay? So those are different types. Let's talk about physical literacy. So we kind of throw that word around. What does it even mean? So basically physical activity and play are super important to developing what's called physical literacy. This is defined as the ability, confidence, and desire to be physically active for life. So we want this lifelong love to be active. So basically, the more your child is physically active, the more they play, the more they gain ability and get confidence in the fundamental movement skills. And those are the basic things, walking, running, climbing, jumping, throwing a ball, catching a ball. So they get, they get competent, they, they get the ability to do these basic movement skills that generates confidence. When they feel more confident, they're more internally motivated and have the desire to keep exercising, to keep doing it, to keep accomplishing these things. So they kind of build on each other Participation, just being more active and playing builds ability. Ability develops confidence. Confidence develops motivation and desire to do more and be physically active for life. So that's physical literacy. It begins in infancy, infancy. So we really need to, as pediatricians and primary care providers and in infancy, start the process of really promoting play. And parenting at mealtime and playtime does a great job with this. They have all the resources you need. So it's, it's really nice because it kind of spells it out for each age and stage. Like, how do I promote this? How do I talk about it? Um, and then like play-based fitness, same thing. So we want, we want more play-based fitness than we do like physical activity. So we want kids to be like active, but they're, it's entertaining for them. So it's structured, it's age appropriate but it's fun and it's entertaining and it doesn't seem like work because they have a lot of play, play time. So in my strong kids class, like we do skill work, we do fundamental skills like jumping and sprinting and squatting and form and technique on things, but we mix it in the whole entire time with play so that they are developing these skills and they don't even know it because they're just having fun, they're being entertained. But we have a structure to the class, we have an organization, but we, we build a lot of play so that whole thing is entertaining and then they're getting fit, but it's play-based, if that makes sense. So that's kind of where you get that lifelong love for fitness instead of someone like making it a chore or like forcing you to do it, or you're really uncomfortable doing it. Um, so where's that ability comes in when we feel more, we feel more competent, then we feel more confident and then we feel more comfortable. So it all kind of links together, but play is really important in developing all of that. So it's really important for parents to, and, and, and uh, like pediatricians, fitness instructors, phys ed teachers um, to connect 
physical activity in play to health and happiness. So when we're being physically active, we want to connect that to happiness, to health, to life, so that they make the connection that those two go together instead of it being like chore or something we have to do, or it just seems, you know, like a pain. Okay, so the, there's lots of physical literacy resources available to you. So I mentioned parenting at mealtime and playtime. They have a little play section for every age and stage. So they, it's just quick for you to easily reference and build that into your well child visits. Um, the Journal of Pediatrics, both of those articles, both of those journal, journal articles I referenced have really good summary tables. But if, to be honest, they're already those are already like built into your parenting and mealtime and playtime resources. So um, the American Academy of Pediatrics Institute for Healthy Childhood Weight has some great learning modules on physical activity, um, obesity in general. So if you if you haven't checked those out as a primary care provider, you should do that. Um, Shape America has awesome awesome printable like downloads for you. There's 19 for infants, there's 20 some for toddlers, there's 25 for preschoolers. And again, they break it down by, by age and stage, developmental stage, and like different activities you can do and how to do them, like what does it mean? So those would be great to print off and give to your parents to build on what the parenting and mealtime and playtime resources give you. It's really like defined like activities, like playing, playing airplane with the baby. So um, that, that is a great resource. The one from Harvard, the Center on the Developing Child is also, fantastic. It has, it has um, resources for play and executive functioning. And they break it down by imaginary play, storytelling, physical activity, movement challenges, and quiet game activity. So they have all these different ideas for you broken down into those categories. And then Active for Life has Raising Physically Literate Kids. And it's PDF playbooks, again, for each broken down by each age group. Because the easiest thing for you as a practitioner is to build it into what you're already doing. You're already assessing their fine motor and gross motor skills as you do their physical exam. So as you become really versed with these powerful play, physical literacy um, activities, you can just kind of, as you're examining the child and talking to them, you can give them suggestions for play while you're doing it. So it doesn't have to take up extra time. Because as we know, you guys are busy, crazy busy. So those are some great, like, fan, like fantastic resources. I can't say enough about them, really good. And I love that the Harvard one has executive functioning. That's, I mean, that's so important too in our kids today. So check them out, really, really good. So let's talk about the role of the pediatrician. And this is also spelled out for you in that Journal of Pediatrics article, it's figure one. I don't know, I should have included it, but first of all, like we just alluded to, you wanna include physical literacy assessments in your physical exams, your well childs, okay? It sounds kind of sounds kind of fancy, doesn't it? A physical literacy assessment, but you're already doing it. You're already doing it. We just didn't label it that. You're you're assessing them. You're assessing their fine motor, their gross motor, their developmental milestones. You're already doing it. So um, they are calling it to be as to be included as a physical activity vital sign. So what you'll see in that um, journal of pediatrics, I just pulled it up here, um, is sample questions that you can put as your physical activity vital sign into your like smart dot phrase or into your like well child template. And it's just questions you ask the family. And there's like three or four different examples they give you. So, some is just generic, like on average, how many days do you, are you active in moderate to physical exercise, moderate to vigorous exercise? And you could put in parentheses like sweating, brisk walk, like so they kind of know what it means. Um, and some of them are just like, in the last seven days, how active were you? And then one of them is like more specific, like, does your child walk or ride their bike to school? Does your child have gym right now? Does your child do any sports? So you can, you can just build those, they're called physical activity vital signs. Just a few questions into your assessment to kind of see like where they are. And you can build your assessment to be bigger if you want to, to include like, what do you have access to? So if you wanna really hone in on giving them a physical activity prescription, you might include questions like, you know, what, what do you have any activity equipment at home, like gym equipment, treadmills? Do you have any like play equipment at home? Do you have a safe place to walk? Do you have access to a gym? Do you have access to kids' classes? So you could actually ask them like what they have access to as well, as far as their physical activity vital signs, because if they've already answered them for you, then you've, and you're doing like your physical exam and your well child assessment, you're gonna be able to build in like a plan for them. When, it, when you get done quicker than having to like go through the whole thing and then ask them all the questions. So you can even ask them the questions while you're doing the physical exam. So does Johnny, is Johnny in any sports? How, what, do you, how, what do you guys do to get active? You can do it like while you're examining them, okay? So it's so physical activity vital sign, that's what that's called. Um, 
And uh, that's basically asking the questions, building it in, promoting play by the age and stage. And that's basically what's called a physical literacy assessment. Uh, remind the parents it's important to schedule activity, to schedule playtime. Yes, we have to schedule it because life is over scheduled, over busy, and we don't have time for anything, including with our infants. So you want to actually schedule in tummy time and play time. So really like start telling your parents it's really important to like schedule in dedicated physical activity or whatever is going to be our infant activities, whatever you want to call them. But if we don't start dedicating time for it, it just doesn't happen. And we want to dedicate that time where the parent is playing with the child instead of the child just putting the parent, putting the infant down for tummy time and they're off doing something else. We want to really remind parents, schedule in dedicated, fully focused, fully engaged, present time with your kids of all ages. Okay, then like I mentioned before, the higher risk, um, the racial minorities, adolescent girls, uh, youth with special needs. So pay special attention to those kids. They're, they're getting missed and they don't have as many opportunities. And so we really have to be creative with them and helping them promote powerful play in the environment that they have available to them. Um, of course, this is all the role of the pediatrician. So discuss the benefits of physical activity. This is where I mentioned like connecting it, connect the benefits to what you're already doing in the exam or, or covering. So you're not like having to like talk about it separate and just giving them a big list of stuff. Link it and connect it to what's already happening in the medical visit. Um, of course, encouraging parents to be role models and get active with their kids, not just telling their kids to be active. That's super important. Framing this as an opportunity to bond with your child. All the parents want to bond with their newborn. So this is, this is a great way to kind of promote play and promote bonding with their infant, but also bonding with their older kids and teenagers because teenagers' communication becomes an issue. And if they have a way that they can get active and play and have fun with their teenagers, this is the way they can bond and connect and maybe improve their communication. So frame physical activity in those ways so that it's more, it seems more doable and it's more desirable instead of just saying, you should exercise for 60 minutes a day, okay? So frame it positively that the parents wanna do it. And then of course, we always have to connect it to fun. And we gotta remind parents that too, like if it's a chore, the kids aren't gonna wanna do it and it just creates like negativity. And so we gotta frame everything that it's fun and, and that's what the word play means, right? It's fun, so, okay. Uh, encourage families to create their own family media use plan and that's, that is available through the AAP, healthychildren.org. Um, you can just type in that media use plan and you type in like the ages of your kids and then it'll spit out this whole printout of, of different guidelines for like social media use and like a uh, sort of like contract you can kind of talk about with your kids and like set up a plan. So if, they, if you have a family media use plan, that's gonna help control the screen time so we can have more time for physical activity and play. And then if you need to, um, and they're actually saying this in the most recent like literature, they're really promoting that you prescribe physical activity. You write a prescription for it, just like you would anything else, right? It's as strong as medication. This is a biggest, bigger mood lister than a drug, right? Mood lifter than a drug. Um, sometimes I write actually for physical therapy for families. So if it's a more overweight or obese kid who is really struggling with movement or is very deconditioned, just playing is uncomfortable for them. And they also don't have the ability and competence in those fundamental movement skills. So if you identify that or you identify like some gross motor delays, write them for actual physical activity because you're, or physical activity, personal, I can't even talk today. Physical therapy, PT, physical therapy. Write them a prescription physical therapy. I have not had any insurance companies deny this. I put deconditioned low back, exercise intolerance, et cetera, whatever else they're having. But if you can get them going to physical therapy appointments a couple of times a week for 12 sessions, that's gonna increase their ability and their competence, which is then gonna increase their confidence, which is then gonna make them more intrinsically motivated to wanna to move more and exercise more and get active more. So even because the, these kids, if they're overweight or obese, they're uncomfortable and it's uncomfortable to move and play or they're self-conscious. So physical therapy has been a great adjunct and you can write the prescription and the family can check their insurance and most of the physical therapy places will actually check their insurance for them. Um, and so I highly recommend that. Or if you have a family um, who is like uh, in like an underserved or low income and they really do not have resources, they don't live in a safe neighborhood, they don't have a place they can play at home or be active, physical therapy prescription is a great one for them too because it gets them moving, gets them active, gets them in a positive energetic environment. Okay, so when prescribing, you wanna use motivational interviewing 
to ensure the prescribed activity is practical and accessible. So you don't wanna say, go walk 60 minutes after work to a family whose neighborhood is not safe in the dark. You get what I'm saying? So you gotta really kind of get a little bit of um, interviewing going to see like what resources are available, what's happening for this family and then pres prescribe something that they can actually do. And you want the prescription to be patient directed anyways. You don't wanna say, you should do this. Da, 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 da. You wanna actually like let them actually develop the prescription for you. But when you make it a prescription, it just makes it a little more powerful. It's coming from their doctor, they respect you and they wanna you know, please you. So the next page we talk about the physical, the fit prescription, fitness prescription. What does that look like? What are the components of it? So if you wanted to prescribe physical activity for a family, this would be what it would look like. So again, don't forget about physical therapy. It is such a great tool for these families. Okay, let's move on to the fitness prescription. That's the next slide. Okay, so um, I just put that at the top to be funny. The diagnosis is EDD, <laughs> exercise deficit disorder, um, but you don't have to put a diagnosis. I would just be funny. Anyway, so fitness prescription, it has a couple components. So F-I-T-T, -T. Um, I actually have three T's. So it's frequency and obviously we want kids moving every day. So ideally we're gonna put every day, but if they're just doing nothing, then you're gonna try to say like, what days of the week do you think would be good for you? And they're like, oh, you know what? Tuesday and Thursday are just totally out for us. It's way too busy. We, we don't get home from work till eight o'clock. You're like, oh yeah, how about Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Okay, so frequency, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Ideally, we wanna move them up to 60 minutes or more every day, but we'll start somewhere. Or the toddlers, three hours, okay? Intensity. So again, we want that moderate to vigorous intensity. And that looks different for everyone. So a, a kid who's not conditioned could just be walking and it's vigorous for, for them. So it really is gonna be dependent on the patient, like what they feel like doing. And then again, the intensity, we wanna just, we wanna remind them some of the time you wanna get sweaty, you wanna feel a little bit out of breath. You wanna just remind them what that feels like. So then they know that they're exercising intense enough. And then time. So time would be duration. So how long? So you, you're gonna spell everything out. Don't leave anything to chance. Everything's very specifically set. Cause if you just say, I'm gonna exercise more or I'm gonna do something three times a week, it's too vague and generic. You want your prescription to be very specific. So what, what exact days of the week? How long? Is it gonna be 10 minutes? Is it gonna be 20? Is it gonna be 60? Is it gonna be two sets of 30? You spell out the actual duration. And again, you might be starting with someone who's doing 10 minutes two times a week. And we think that's not enough, but that's enough for them. That's where you start and you meet them where they're at and let them direct the next goal from there once they feel successful and accomplished with that. So we start small, we go big. So we're not gonna be hitting that 60 minute um, recommendation right away for most people. Start small, win big, okay? So then I include an extra time because I also have the patient or the family spell out what time of day. Because again, leave nothing to chance. If you just say, we're gonna do it, we never get to it. We just don't get to it. So you're gonna say right after school or right after dinner or Saturday and Sunday before church or you know, before in the morning before school. Most people don't pick that one, but you know, you're gonna actually pick the time of day and you're gonna encourage the family to write it on their calendar, just like it's an appointment, just like it's any other scheduled activity that they have to go to. And so that's where the, that's where the time of day is really important. So I have time as duration and I have them spell out the time of day and then the type. So, so I, ideally we're gonna get down to like, they're, ex, they're moving every day. And so we're gonna spell out the different types. So it might be like Monday, I, we do, we fit just dance for a half an hour. And then we go outside for a walk for a half an hour. And then Tuesday, oh, that's a busy day. He's just gonna be home doing like a YouTube, a YouTube video. Wednesday, he has soccer. So, you, so you're putting out the different types and you're gonna spell it out for the week. So they actually know what they're doing every day. And by the way, this knowing what they're doing provides structure in this world of unstructure and COVID and it provides certainty. So when, when our kids feel uncertainty, they feel stressed, they feel anxious, and that's what's happening with COVID. So we need to create some certainty for them and a fitness prescription provides specifics and certainty, okay? Which then de-stresses. And then again, you're aiming for, I don't do this right away, it depends on what the family has available to them and it depends on what they wanna do, but adding in three times a week where they're doing some weight bearing and muscle building, bone building exercises, um, that's a little harder for some kids. So. Um, if I can just get them moving at first, then we build in like, now we need to add in some push-ups and squats and some weight wearing muscle building exercises, but I don't do it all at once because it gets to be overwhelming. So just get them moving first and then we can develop and add on all the different types 
and all the different intensities. So that's your fitness prescription. And then let's talk about the resources that are available for pediatricians on physical activity assessment and counseling. So this is directly a table directly from the Journal of Peds article. And I'm gonna, I gave you some more earlier in the talk, which were, which were the um, physical literacy ones. I'm not gonna go through these, but you can see um, all these different ones, prescription for activity. There's the shape again, exercise as medicine is a good one. Of course, the Institute for Healthy Childhood Weight has tons. Um, and then there's like the park and recreation one. That one's really good. So um, again, just click on these links get a feel for all the resources that are available to you so you can quickly and have something ready for you can quickly uh, give to families to access. But this, are, this is all good resources, especially the parenting and mealtime and playtime resources to help you build that um, fitness-based play into the well-child visits and their normal ages and stages in growth and development. Okay, so let's get to the heart of the name of the talk getting active, playing inside during COVID and cold weather. So I try, try to focus in on, you really have to get a handle on the four S's. So in order to have success with getting active when it's cold, we're just unmotivated and COVID is compounding all of that. I encourage families to kind of pay attention to four things. So one is stress, two is screens, three is sleep, and four is structure. So if you can help a family manage their stress, by empowering them to kind of structure and schedule out their screens, their sleep and their activity, that, that'll kind of overall just create like a de-stressing environment because it's more structured and it's more scheduled and they feel more in control. Because right now there's a lot of things we can't control in COVID. So we wanna give parents back control and how we do that is kind of addressing the four S's. So kind of wanna talk about their stressors because if they have a lot of stuff going on, we're not gonna pile on a physical activity prescription too and be sensitive to that. Um, but we can maybe try to build in some different things to help them. So the parenting of mealtime and playtime has some really great trackers. It's what I reference here. They have one to track. So this is a great place to start with families is just having them become more aware. Let's, let's just start with awareness. Like where are you at right now as a family? Let's take this tracker. Let's track our screen time. Let's track our sleep. Let's track, track our physical activity. And then they can come back and you can say, okay, let's based on this, let's, let's, let's set a goal now. So um, let's see, are we on the next slide? The four, the trackers. Yeah, there they are. So parenting at mealtime and playtime has these great trackers. So they have physical activity that has, see all the little squares they can track. They have a screen time one that also has squares. So this is page one of it. And then sleep, the sleep talks about the routines and the importance of it. And then there's a second page that has, again, the blocks for families to make a commitment to something and fill it in. They're, they're great trackers. So this is a great place. If families seem really stressed and overwhelmed, this is a great place to start. Like, let's just start like paying attention to what we're doing for physical activity, what do we feel like we can commit to right now? What are we, how much time are we spending on the screens? How are we doing with sleep? So let's just start with paying attention to that in tracking it and then come back and then let's see where we can go from there. So we start where we are, empower the family to make a step towards the right direction, especially during COVID because it's so stressful. And then also this will help train them to schedule in their physical activity, all ages, all ages. Because we schedule in our school age kids, our middle school and high school kids that are in sports and activities. Sometimes they're too overscheduled. So we have a schedule in that regard, but we're not scheduling in that play time, that family engagement time. Um, especially at the younger ages, we're not like actually carving out time to be fully engaged and present and play with our kids. So let's talk about inside play. There's lots of different resources available to you for playing inside. There, I mean, there are tons and tons and tons. We have like right now two slides worth of resources that have um, like PDFs, they have toolboxes, they have videos. And you, again, you're gonna just have to click on each one and find the one that just resonates with you or just seems like a good fit. Um, some of them are designed more for like PE teachers. Um, so that might help in some of the head starts and different places that need to get more active. Um, the unicefkidpower.org they have three to five minute, they call them power ups, which are just quick little like three to five minute bursts you can do. Um, Fuel Up to Play 60 has a whole like school based programming you can do. Um, let's go to the next one. I'm not going to read through all these because it's just you need to check them out. Les Mills Born to Move, that is a paid one. So that's a paid membership. But again, if you have a family that um, can, can do it, they, it's like a membership and they have all these like classes. It's called Born to Move. Um, I bet you the NFL Play 60, they have a ton of resources. 
uh, lots of physical activity module. Shape America has ton. Special Olympics has one school of strength. That's great for your special needs kids. Um, and then heart.org has some good ones. They have some good PDFs for creating circuits. They have the 25 ways to get moving. Um, they have tons of stuff. Fitastic is really good. This Hy-Vee Kids, um, HyVKidsFit.com is a good one. It has like a 30 day play. So again, they have, they have lots of resources for families. If they're just looking for ideas, they can click on any one of these like online web-based resources that most of the time have toolkits and playbooks and printables and all sorts of different things to get your kids moving inside. And a lot of, a lot of them, almost all of them have like special features right now for COVID addressing that we are all struggling getting kids playing, especially inside during COVID, during the shutdown and during winter. So inside play, let's go over a few apps. So these are the, these are the ones that my, my patients and kids love the most. Um, go Noodle, I think everyone knows about, Nike Training Club, seven minute workout for kids, seven minutes. So there's a great place for someone to get started. I hate it that they have to be on their screen, but hey, at least they're moving. Okay, so seven minutes, Swerk It. So Swerk It used to be like a Swerk It for adults and then Swerk It Kids. It's now all in the same app. So the adult uh, portion is a paid, but the kids portion is free. So they just still have to create an account, but they don't have to pay for the kids part. Um, it's a, that's a great app. So they can, they can choose what they wanna do like muscle building, stretching, cardio, they can choose the duration, like five, 10, 15 minutes. And then it has music playing, which is, which is better. It used to be no music and it was super boring. And then they time, they time it for 30 second intervals and there's a little kid showing them the movement. So they have the kids showing them the movement, they count down the timer and they have music. So that's a great app. That one's I, I tell families to use like when they're sitting in like waiting rooms and like they have extra time and the kids are just bouncing off the walls, like pull out your Swerk It app and have your kid do a little like five or 10 minutes Swerk It session all body weight stuff, super, super easy. And then they get to choose. Then NFL Play 60 has an app. Healthy Hip Hop is a fun one. Um, Kids Strong TV is really good, but it's just for Apple TV only. And then, um, so that's Inside Play with apps. Inside Play, YouTube has a lot of great resources, especially now during COVID. So if we go to the next slide, we'll talk about the YouTube resources. Um, Spider Fit Kids is a big one. This guy developed like a whole program it's all surrounding physical literacy. And his is called PE for your living room. He's a super fun guy. Um, then there's Cosmic Kids Yoga. A lot of my kids love that one. Box Kids is through Reebok. And you can actually sign up as like an organization or a school or a practice. And they give you all these different like calendars and all these different things to like, they, they kind of spell out a whole curriculum for you. Kids Strong is for little kids. And it's actually, um, right now, before COVID, it was just in brick and mortar. And it, it's not everywhere, it's only in a few places. But since um, COVID, they actually developed a whole online curriculum. And this is for little kids and they train their body and their brain. So they have like a body movement thing and like a brain activity for the kids. That one is, and it's character building. So that one, that one, I love that one. And then Zumba Kids, everybody loves. Kids Bop, dance along videos, everybody loves those. Um, and then if you, this one you have to have access to Facebook, um, but there is, it's called Virtual Recess Club. It's from Recess and Results. That's also a membership based, um, inside play, but it is an actual person leading a class with like either their own kids or they have kids that they're using. And so it is, it is fantastic. They have some great, great fun activities to do with the kids and it's all the power of play. So virtual recess club is 100% play-based fitness. And so, and it gives you great ideas as like a parent, like how to, what to do. Okay. So inside play, let's talk about some activities and games that are out there. There's there's hundreds and hundreds, guys. I just put I just put in a few that, that are kind of fun. So scavenger hunt, you can either make up your own or and you can have the kids be going inside and outside all around your house. Um, but the um, the American Heart Association already has one like spelled out. Um, so if you just click on that, you can print out the PDF of the um, it's already a scavenger hunt. It'd be like run upstairs and grab the Kleenex box, bring it back to the computer, go, go sit on the couch five times. It's like that. Like you go just go around your house with common things. Um, you can have create an obstacle course, have the families create an obstacle course with their kids. And again, just use your everyday stuff. Use your imagination. You have to get creative. Like what do I have in my house that my kids can climb over, that my kids can climb under, that my kids can climb higher, that my kids can push, they can pull. Can they weave throughout cones or can you put little markers you can use balls of socks like whatever you got to get really creative um and then I like obstacle course I like to play gears with them what I call gears and that is like you have them go slow you have them go medium you have them go fast you have them go backwards you have them go sideways um so that they kind of learn the different like slow medium slow 
moderate fast. And then it can kind of assess like when I'm going slow, that's just light activity. When I'm going high gear fast, I'm sweating more. So they can kind of get used to that feeling. Um, so I like to do gears with obstacle course. Um, create your own circuit. If you don't know how to do that or where to start, the American Heart Association has a PDF for it. And it'll tell you like station one, 10 squats. You know, and you can also create stations like around your house. Um, brain break, boredom, buster cards. So I have families sit down with their kids and get any kind like no cards or whatever, and just start like writing down activities. They can, and let the kids help you. Let the kids think of some, like they might say bear crawl or jumping jacks or whatever. And you put them all down, then you put them in like a box. And if they need a brain break from school, from virtual learning, pull out a card, do it, pull out a couple cards, do it. Or if they're running around saying they're bored, then you go up, oh, board and buster, grab a card, let's do it. So that's just one to kind of keep on hand for quick. Beat the clock, um, just like setting a timer and have the kids do the chores as fast as they can turning chores into play, making it fun. Um, and also they, they start racing and competing and they learn what vis vigorous activity feels like, right? Um, deck of cards workout. So that's where you take the um, heart club, spade and diamond, you assign it an activity. So it might be like hearts are squats and diamonds are pushups and you know clubs are run to the door and back. And then, um, then of course they draw like a three of clubs. They're gonna be like three times running to the door and back. So the kids will know this activity means this and you have to do the number on the card. So deck of cards is fun. Once you get through 52, that's challenging. That's really challenging. Uh, milk jug bowling. So you can take milk jugs or water jugs that are empty and create you know, the bowling thing and then just find a ball that you can roll and let them knock it over. And then they kind of have to run back and forth to set the, set the uh, milk jugs back up. So start collecting your milk jugs. Um, animal Tabata. So Tabata is a timing interval. It's 20 seconds on, 10 second rest for eight rounds. So it's four minutes. So it's a quick little four minute workout. And if you get the free Tabata timer, there's a ton of them. Um, it just times it for you. So you'll have them do like a walk like a duck for 20 seconds and they get to rest. And the next one's bear crawl for the next Tabata timer. And then you could just pick animal, animal movements. That's kind of fun for the kids. Human Simon. So Human Simon is just it as you remember the Simon game with the like red, green, yellow, blue. And so you can either, you can get an app, actually the Simon app. But what you wanna do is you wanna get, um, like pieces of construction paper or whatever to make the markers like red, yellow, green, blue. So if they're doing it in their planks, so this might be for, it could be any age kid, but they have the colors in front of them. They're holding their plank. And then if the timer, if you're using the Simon thing, it'll say like red, green, and they have to go red, green, you know, touch red, green, touch green. Or you can just say, you can call out red, green, blue, red, green, blue. So, or you can space them apart and they have to run from the red to the green to the blue. Or if you just said red. So it's like, you know how, you know how Simon goes. You get what I'm saying? That one's kind of fun. Uh, most of these games, like in kids, they're going to be like short lived. You're going to be playing this game like five to maybe 15 minutes most, but you then you got to come up with something else. So, animal freeze tag, you're, they're just running around like an animal that you call out, like bear crawl to try to tag people. And then when you say freeze, they have to hold. So, again, it's just using your brain. Tail tag is um, basically flag football, but you can do it at home if you have clothespins or if you just have Walmart bags or grocery bags, they tuck them in their waistband like maybe three or four. And if you run all around and they have to grab, you know, you have to grab the flag, just like flag football. So you just use Walmart bags. Um, healthy eating truth and trash. This one is, um, this one you need a little more space and you need like a big cushion or a beanbag for them to run into. But basically there's like a cushion or a beanbag at the end of the room. You, they're at this end. You're going to call out like a truth, like you're smart. And they, they, when you call out the truth, you tell them you have to jump up and down and say, yay. And you're going to call out like, or you can call it a truth of like a healthy eating, like an apple or a banana. And they go, yay. And then if it's um, like Doritos, they have to run and like throw themselves into the cushion trash. That's trash. Like Doritos are trash. So you can throw out like healthy, you can do it with anything you want to teach them about. So healthy eating, you can teach them about positive, like I am statements. When I say something good and kind, that's a, that's a jump up and down. Yay. When I say something mean about myself, or mean to somebody else that's trash, we run and throw ourselves into the beanbag. So that was just kind of fun, but you can also do a little bit of character building with that one or education on healthy eating. Um, find the beat. So this one's super fun. Um, developing rhythm in kids is also really important for play and for literacy and for language development. Um, so if you have drumsticks, you can use those, you can use wooden spoons, you can use pool noodles. So you wanna just put a song on, let them start finding the beat. And then you tell them, do it quiet, do it loud do it in, do it out, do tap them up, tap them down, tap them to the side, tap them behind. So you just tell them the direction. So they have to follow directions and they're learning rhythm. And then if you don't want to do that, you guide it. You can just type in drumstick workout on YouTube or noodle workout because there's a lot of there's a lot of those out now with, with COVID in the classroom and everything. And they can do, do it along with other kids doing drumsticks or noodles. So that one's super fun. 
So hopefully you got a few ideas from that one. Let's go to the next list. Indoor snow, snowstorm, you need cotton balls. So you need lots of cotton balls and they're cheap. You can get them at the dollar store, you know, the big bag. And so you wanna scatter them all around the floor and then have like a basket in the middle. And they have, to, they have to run around and get all the cotton balls and put them into the basket. And then when they collect them all, you throw it and then they get another cotton ball snowstorm, gather them all back up. So again, of course, this is for little kids. I'm not sure like your teenager would wanna do it, but maybe you never know. So that's super easy. They're soft, it's fun. Um, balloon volleyball is simple. Just blow up a balloon, volleyball back and forth. You can use the couch as the net if you want, or you don't have to have a net. Balloon in flight is where you can use this beach ball or a balloon where you just don't let it hit the floor. And the kids are going around and you guys are tapping it back and forth and they get, they get lots of multi-directional movement and it's super fun. Balloon tennis is just taking tennis rackets and using a big balloon as the ball. Um, if you have tennis rackets, a lot of people don't have tennis rackets. Uh, Minute Madness. So Minute Madness is super fun. This is super easy. You have to have two sections of the room, like two sides. So whatever your room, however you can break it up that each kid has a side or each family team has a side. And then you can make a line or whatever. Um, the easiest thing is just to use balled up socks, but you line them all up on the line. And then you set a timer for a minute or two minutes. And the object of the game is to get all the socks onto the other person's side. So they get them on their side, they get them back off their side onto your side and it's just a big scramble. So the timer goes off, whoever has the most socks on their side loses. And you can do it with, like in strong kids in the gym, we do, we have them move push and pull objects that are soft and like they can, you can do other objects, but they get people, the kids get a little crazy and they start throwing stuff everywhere. So it can't be something they can get hurt with. So it has to be like, it could be stuffed animals. It could be soft things where they just have to move them all to the other person's side and you can simultaneously have to keep getting them off your side onto the other person's side. Super fun, super fun. But again, about a minute, minute and a half and you can play like three rounds and then they're done with it. But it's still, it's fun. We talked about gears earlier, beanbag toss. So dance party, I mean, dance, dance is like the miracle activity. If your kid's in a bad mood, put some fun music on, just start jumping around and dancing. You can play dance party freeze. So where you're dancing and dancing and dancing, you stop the music, they have to freeze wherever they are. That's kind of fun. So you can just, you can do a dance party to like bust the mood before school if everybody's in a bad mood. Um, the floor is lava is uh, you put cushions and whatever on the floor and they have to go from one to the other. They can't touch the actual floor because it's lava. Um, just go to the mall and walk, mall walking. There's, you don't have to be creative with that. Um, and then I usually recommend like if they're going to play board games, just make them active. So if it's, a, if it's a game that has dice, every time we roll a six, we have to jump up and do like 10 squat jumps, you know, or six squat jumps or whatever. So you can make, or if we land on a certain space, we have to run up and down the stairs once. So you can make like a board game active. Then of course we have active video games. Um, everybody knows about those. Um, I would say that I would say they provide light to moderate activity for kids. Um, mostly light. Um, some could be moderate. If anyone has done just dance, I'm going to say that's vigorous because whoo, that one is hard, but, uh, video games, of course they're, they're, again, they're in front of a screen, but at least they're moving. So, so active video games do have a role, but we want to kind of balance that with some in-person fully engaged, just fun family games. And then 10 minute timer you could use for anything. So if your kids don't feel like doing the chores, up 10 minute timer, let's see how much we can do in 10 minutes. If they don't feel like moving, you'd be like, let's just play it for 10 minutes. Just give me 10 minutes, set a timer. When it goes off, they can be done. But more often than not, they're having fun and then they'll keep going. So 10 minute timer is a great tool. Works for chores, works for everything. Okay, so indoor play. So those are all things you can do yourself as a parent or a caregiver or a practitioner recommending it to families. Um, there's also inside play, like some things are opening back up in Ohio. Um, so the next page um, shows you, if you go to 99boulders.com and indoorclimbing.com, that's gonna show you all the climbing and bouldering gyms in Ohio that are open. Um, playcleveland.com, play CLE, play CLE. Um, again, we'll kind of talk about the indoor attraction. So those are be like a fun family outing. You're not gonna be able to do that all the time, but it might give kids, again, if they're having fun moving and playing, they're gonna be more likely to want to do physical activities outside of that fun activity. So that one, the Ninja Warrior Gyms, ninjaguide.com. Again, you can find the ones in Ohio and then indoor trampoline parks. They're all back open. Um, I'm in Northeast Ohio in our area, um, of course with rules and regulations, but they're starting to all open back up. So, all right, then. My last one, I know the topic is playing inside, but I really still want you to get your families outside. It's okay, bundle them up, they can go outside, layer them up, have them get fresh air, and then you could do fun activities outside with them. Again, the more structured it is outside, the better than being like, just go outside and play, Johnny. And he like walks around and is just like, okay, I'm bored. You gotta do something with them. So encourage your families 
to do an outdoor obstacle course, do an outdoor scavenger hunt, build a snowman, of course, snow shoveling. You can do a relay with snow shoveling. They can make a snow volcano. So the first step is they have to get active by building the mounds. So they're gonna go around and build as many mounds as they can. And then they just need, you need something to fit into the mound, like a water bottle or something that you don't care about, a bowl or jar, mason jars, whatever. Um, you fill it up with water, with, uh, water and vinegar, food coloring. And then after the mounds are built, all of, then you put the baking soda in and it explodes like a volcano the color all over the snow. So, but they first have to ha be active and help you build the mounds. So that's just a fun, quick activity. And then of course, metroparks.net. I feel like they're still, last time I looked, um, mostly still closed. But if you get on there, they're gonna, and that you, they have a whole family kids section, you can kind of see what's open and what's not in the Metro Parks. So the biggest, biggest takeaway to remember, encourage your, your parents, caregivers, grand, grandparents to play with the kids. Super powerful, it's a time to bond with their kids and then they have to make it fun. So if you don't make it fun, it's not gonna create that physical literacy that we want to happen. Um, so the power of play cannot be underestimated. All right, thank you so much. We'll take questions. Yeah, any questions that you all have? Um, I know there was some talk in the chat box. Um, another idea someone suggested was making a paper plate paddle and hitting a balloon hanging from a string. Um, That's a good one, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds. <laughs> so many. Um, is there any questions or are there any questions that Dr. Levitt um, can answer before we wrap up? I have a few things to touch on. Um, and we appreciate everyone joining. And I know that um, some people had asked for a brochure with different, with some of Dr. Levitt's ideas and examples in those. So I will work on making those um, this week, and I will send them out um, for you all to reference. Are there any more infant little exercise things besides like tummy time and infant yoga that she can share? There, I mean, there's a whole list. If you pull up, like just go to Shape America, those, go to those ones I referenced. And a lot, of, a lot of the infant one is the parent just interacting with the child, like talking to them and like, you know, and then when they get a little bit older than tummy time, object play is good where they're giving them an object to just explore and examine. So object play is a good one. Um, but if you go to that Shape America, there's 19 different activities for infants, like airplane, you know, you're woo, you know, um, so that they give you, they give you like a whole list. And also the one from Harvard gives you a whole list. That, and those three that I put on the one slide, they, they, they give you like a complete comprehensive list. I can't do it justice because they do such a great job. Thank you. Any other questions? But parenting and mealtime and playtime already also does spell it out for you too. So don't, don't forget that resource. Yeah. So I'll go over a few of the parenting uh, and mealtime playtime resources. Dr. Levitt also created um, a playing inside handout that we um, just got a first draft for. So we're working on that and hopefully we'll have that to send out in the next few months. So that will be great. Um, as far as other PMP resources, like I said before, we have them specific to topics and then age specific. So we have them on play, um, hunger cues, meal time, and then age specific transitioning to solids, picky eating, breastfeeding, really any topic that you need. You can download these on our website or they're available on our parenting and meal time and playtime mobile app. They can be downloaded on Google Play or um, the Apple Store. I also wanted to touch again on our parenting and mealtime and playtime toolkit. You can register for the toolkit using the link there. And like I said before, all the resources are available on here. So many um, things that you can touch on. All the trainings are linked. You can go back and watch them later. So please register for the toolkit if you haven't already. And this is the link to the mobile app and also the link to the resources. The trackers are on this website as well. Um, any handouts that you need, food and security handouts, really anything. And you can, they're also available on the mobile app, so you can download them there. And then I will send this out via email, but you can take the survey to receive your MOC and CME credits, as well as a certificate for participation using the survey here, if um, that is how you'll re receive your credit. So please fill that out and I'll send it via email too. 
And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. My name is Alex Miller. And I am the program manager for the Parenting and Meltdown and Playtime program. Um, if any questions come up, please let me know and I will send them to Dr. Levitt as a follow-up. But we appreciate everyone for joining today. Thank you again to the Ohio, Ohio Department of Health and thank you to Dr. Levitt, Levitt for taking the time to present to us today. It was a great training and we are um, excited that you were able to, yeah. to be here. Can you show that one slide right before this one with survey again? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you all so much. And um, please feel free to send me an email if you have any questions or anything like that. But I will work on sending out a brochure um, with the information that you all asked for and links and, and everything like that. So will be looking for that um, in the next few days. and. We hope you all have a great rest of your week. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Levin. you. Thank you. Do you need me to stay on, Alex? You can go ahead and hop off. Okay. See you later. Thank you so much. Bye.